Okay, and do we have a projection? We don't have it. How would you like uh, it? Just this. Oh, a division of Optima partners. <laughs> One by three. Just, yeah. Uh, I'm not do you want to do the, the, the verbal? Okay, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us for the last meetup of the year. Uh, we're going to start again next year, but we'll don't worry about that after Christmas. Uh, today we have. Uh, Dana, excuse me, is Kunchula or Kunchila? Kuncha. Kunchula. <laughs> From uh, uh, BioAccelerate, the division of Optima Partners. Uh, she's going to explain us the method that they have developed to uh, accelerate and upscale um, genome wide association studies. She's going to drive us through all of the uh, at, at high level, at least, the details of the method. So if you're not confident with genetics analysis, don't worry. She's going to drive us through that. So, Zena, floor is yours. Okay. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us today. Um, my name, uh, as I was presented, is Jana. And I work for BioAccelerate, which is a division in a small data science and engineering consultancy company. Um, I'll just walk you through um, GWAS and the development of GWAS methods and how they're integrated in drug discovery and biobank design. Uh, and then I'll uh, also present one of the tools that we developed that we believe might be resolving some of the challenges uh, faced by uh, GWAS uh, in the next um, years and decades. So before, yeah. Uh, it's okay with that. Yeah. 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 Uh, it's it's so. December in England, and it looks like this all the time. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, the colors are actually very good for this lighting. Uh, so before I proceed to do so, I'll just very briefly tell you who we are, so that you understand why I believe that we have some competence to be discussing the future of GWAS and its integration in drug discovery and uh, to, to tell you more about our style of working so that you understand where the motivation for addressing those challenges also comes from. Um, so first of all, uh, as I mentioned, BioAccelerate is the vision of a small data science consultancy company and the most important part from our business model is that we are not just consultants to tell clients what to do, but we actually work with academic partners in order for us to integrate the latest uh, cutting edge developments uh, in <coughs> the sciences and then deploy them uh, into actionable results for our clients. So all of uh, the people at BioAccelerate are PhD level trained professionals, both in academia and in industry, and we do keep actively publishing. Um, our clients vary from small emerging biotech companies to very big blue chip uh, pharma companies, and we are actively engaged with different academic partners, such as um, Imperial, uh, Fingen, Broad Institute, and our strongest collaboration is with the University of Edinburgh, as we are uh, an Edinburgh-based company, and um, we even have part-time uh, PhD and postdoc students that work part-time for University of Edinburgh and part-time for us. Um, very briefly, our focus in our statistical and methodological development and its application, and this is further complemented by our machine learning and engineering expertise, because we are based in a data science and engineering company, so we have access to uh, all the resources um, that are all provided to other clients outside of the health sector. So, moving towards what this uh, meeting actually is about, um, I just w very quickly want to refresh your minds on what GWAS is. GWAS uh, is the abbreviation for Genome-Wide Association Studies, and the main idea behind it is that when <clears throat> you have different individuals that you know, for example, they have um, Alzheimer's disease or their healthy controls, you can extract for different regions of the genome, known as SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms, you can extract the genotype <clears throat> from the mother and from the father strand. This is why you get two letters per person per SNP, and for some 
uh, SNPs, you might have a very clear separation between case and controls. For other ones, you might not have such a clear separation at the LEO level. Conventional GWAS studies usually uh, involve, um, uh, are usually done through using a linear regression analysis. If you have a tr quantitative trait that you want to test, such as uh, body mass index or height, uh, or they use a logistic regression if you want to test a binary trait, such as do I have Alzheimer's disease or I, do I not have it? The challenge is uh, accounting for different confounding factors. Most of the time, the different methods um, by default account for age, uh, sex, ethnicity, and relatedness that have huge implication on the outcome of these genetic results. Some popular methods that some of you might have seen in the literature are SAGE, FASGY1, and REGINI. Uh, and the challenge over the last couple of years has been to actually make those methods as fast as possible <clears throat> for the growing data sizes that have been collected. A very standard output from a GWAS analysis is a so-called Manhattan plot. Uh, on the axis, you have the different SNPs that are ordered by their position on the chromosomes. So this is from the first to the 22nd chromosome. And on the y-axis, we have the minus log 10 p-value. The idea is that the larger <coughs> this transformed p-value is, uh, the more likely it is to be associated uh, the more, more, more likely is that SNP to be associated to the tested phenotype. So a large transform p-value um, br brings to light more evidence to suggest that there actually is a genotype-phenotype association. And all of the <coughs> studies and uh, everything that people usually do is to take those SNPs uh, at the top, map them to gene, and look uh, and try to identify whether there are potential drug targets that, then get, that can be progressed um, and develop medication for and used to treat um, the disease or the phenotype of interest. Now, <clears throat> one of the big problems is that this study started being done in around 2004 for the first time in Big Pharma. I think actually GSK was the first place where a GOS analysis was conducted. Um, and people started collecting all of these <clears throat> genes that came out of this analysis. The problem was that on average you extract between 30 and 50 SNPs per study. And depending on how you want to map them to genes and proteins, that list might grow to two or 300 genes per study. Um, even though some of the big pharma companies have a lot of money, they don't have that much money to develop 200 different drugs uh, for a certain disease. Um, and people realize that very quickly that we do need to think about ways how to filter that list to the most potential and most likely um, drug targets for which there is not only genetic evidence, but there is also biofunctional evidence to suggest why and how they're linked to the disease. So <clears throat> this is why, before addressing what are the challenges linked to GWAS right now and in the next decade, um, <clears throat> and how some new methods uh, can address them, I'm going to very quickly tell you about the impact of these large-scale genetic associations and the so-called uh, emerging causal inference tools on drug discovery and validation. And the aim is to highlight <clears throat> that genetic associations and GWAS right now is never progressed on its own for drug development. It, mo most of the time right now in almost every company that I've worked for or I have seen, uh, causal inference tools are used to increase the evidence suggesting that that gene or drug target uh, is one that most likely will succeed later on. And why do we build causal inference tools around genetic evidence? Well, uh, in 2014, after maybe one decade of all of this GWAS analysis and integrating genetic analysis in drug development, um, Matt Nelson uh, at GSK said, well, I'll get all the data for all of the targets that we have uh, pushed up until now for drug development, and I'll see what is the likelihood of success if your target has genetic evidence support versus the case when it doesn't. And he actually managed to prove that a target validated by human genetic evidence is at least two times as likely to progress from preclinical assessment to being an approved drug. So obviously in 2014, this was like um, a hu it's, it wasn't a like, huge success, but it was huge news, and everyone was like, well, we definitely need to start integrating human genetic evidence into our target validation pipe and target prioritization pipelines. 
Uh, Matt uh, published a paper, like I think three or four months ago, there is a preprint where he further validates with later findings, uh, with uh, latest up-to-date information, these findings, and also they were uh, validated by an independent group in 2019. And <clears throat> the integration of human genetic evidence uh, essentially uh, aimed to uh, address a couple of the drug discovery challenges. And, uh, and there is different examples for them. I'll quickly highlight some real life examples about how that was done. Uh, but usually they're around uh, accelerating the discovery of novel targets, I think. Uh, accelerating the discovery of novel targets, uh, providing more evidence for validating targets, <clears throat> uh, predicting potential adverse events. Uh, it has also been used successfully for drug repurposing. So, for example, a drug called tocilizumab was repurposed for, from rheumatoid arthritis for um, decreasing the likelihood of a COVID patient um, being hospitalized. Uh, and also, genetic evidence has also been uh, used to identify likely responders so that you speed up your clinical trials and also reduce the size of your clinical trials. So <clears throat> how do these causal inference methods work? Well, the aim of the causal inference methods in combination with GWAS data aim to utilize the human genetic evidence so that you can essentially distinguish between spurious associations and actual causal associations. If you think about the linear or logistic regression, the only thing that they tell you is a correlation. So you identify whether a gene is correlated to a disease, but you don't know whether that relationship is a causal one, and it, it could very easily also be a false positive one. So causal inference tools aim to disrupt the causal pathway by adding additional evidence to the GWAS findings in order uh, for you to identify potential uh, drug candidates. So from starting only from GWAS, basic GWAS correlations, we first try to a label and um, link, um, sorry, to label and prioritize the most likely ones uh, that have a causal role. Then by applying causal inference tools, we are identifying um, um, causal pathways and identifying uh, a significant causal relationships between gene and phenotypes. Some tools can tell you what the direction of that causal relationship uh, is, some tools cannot tell you that, but they tell you that there is strong evidence to suggest a causal relationship. And from <clears throat> discovering those causal pathways, we validate the gene candidates by interpreting the parameters from uh, these methods uh, through um, essentially interpreting how they could down or regulate um, uh, the, um, uh, how they d up, down or upregulate the effect on the desired phenotype. So for example, if I decrease the, the expression of gene A, I am going to reduce, um, for example, a high blood pressure because that gene controls, uh, the high expression of that gene controls um, high blood pressure. So one example I really love to give, and it's very popular in the literature if anyone's familiar with Mendelian randomization, is this um, uh, real life example where uh, genetic analysis was used to discover novel, novel targets. And the main aim of it was to identify a target that can prevent coronary heart disease through blocking uh, an IL-6 receptor. So <clears throat> IL-6R is a well-known inflammatory mechanism that's associated with increased uh, risk of coronary heart disease. And a SNP lying on IL-6R uh, has a known function on the IL-6 circulation. On the other hand, tocilizumab is an antibody uh, that blocks IL-6R, and it was licensed for rheumatoid arthritis. So the authors of this Lancet uh, study uh, wanted to identify whether blocking IL-6R would actually reduce the risk of coronary heart disease. And they explored the effect of the SNP RS5 compared to the effect of the drug tocilizumab when it was issued to patients. And what they discovered is that low effect of the SNP was linked to low C-reactivin protein concentration and to low fibrinogen concentration, and high effect of the SNP was linked to high IL-6 um, IL concentration. This pattern was overlapping and following exactly the same pattern as the effect of the drug when it was issued to patients with rheumatoid arthritis. When using a causal inference tools, the um, 
Authors successfully managed to show that IL-6 R signaling has a causal role in the development of coronary heart disease, and thus the blockage of IL-6 R could also provide a novel therapeutic approach for the prevention of coronary heart disease. Another example that I really like to give from <clears throat> using causal inference tools is uh, how the role of genetic analysis and genetic associations in the risking clinical trials. An example I'm going to give is for a failed drug called Darapodip uh, that was tested uh, to reduce the risk of coronary heart disease. So Darapodip had fantastic results up to phase three clinical trials. Uh, and also uh, in preclinical and phase one and two clinical trials, it successfully managed to reduce the activity and concentration of this um, uh, a protein LPP L82. However, in 2014, it was published as a failed clinical trial, even though it was tested in more than 15,000 patients for, more, for like almost four years, it sadly fa uh, failed to meet its primary endpoints and thus uh, was proven to be unsuccessful in reducing the risk of coronary heart disease. Um, a study in 2010 that was attempting to integrate uh, Mendelian randomization as a causal inference tool for genetics actually predicted the failure of the trial a few years before it was actually officially um, published as a failed trial. What the author showed was that the genetic variants that were linking to LPPO2 were associated with the levels of LPPO2, so lower effect was linked to lower levels of LPPO2 and vice versa, but it, they also showed that this same genetic variants did not associate with any other risk factors for coronary heart disease. And in fact, the same genetic factors did not associate with coronary heart disease itself. So they made the very, very, <clears throat> okay, not big statement, but conclusion that the expression of a target doesn't necessarily guarantee that that target is going to have a causal effect on a disease or a phenotype of interest. So taking a step back in light of these different examples that I just gave you, we can think about causal inference tools as moving away from associations and actually plugging on into um, tools that can enable us to identify the causal relationship between a genetic variant and a phenotype of interest that could potentially be mediated by gene expression or by protein concentration levels as well. And these are just very different type of scenarios, I'm not going to go into details, that can be addressed through these causal inference tools. And the most popular, or po popular causal inference tools uh, are Mendelian randomization, field was could be quantified um, as, as such, and co-localization as well. So <clears throat> now I hope that now I, I provided you with an overview of what GWAS is. Um, how genetic evidence from GWAS uh, has been used in the literature and in the industry to help with target identification or target validation approaches. And I'm, I just really wanted to highlight that even though GWAS might on, results on their own might not be enough to drive forward um, identification or validation um, or clinical trials in combination with causal inference tools and additional evidence from gene expressions, protein concentration levels, uh, maybe methylation or other data, you could combine them in, very in, in, in various ways and extract uh, further evidence for uh, the targets uh, that are reliable. But all of these methods are absolutely useless if there is not a GWAS. So if you don't run the GWAS analysis, you might still have EQTLs or PQTLs or MQTLs or all this sort of EQTLs, but you're linked to the disease or the phenotype of interest comes from a GWAS analysis. So the GWAS challenges that are currently faced by the drug discovery and biobank design industry are very important and we really need to focus right now on resolving them so that we enable um, an even better drug discovery approach. So what are pressing challenges for drug discovery and biobank design? I have categorized them in four different categories. The first one is data privacy. How are we going to enable massive uh, meta-analysis study. And what I mean by that is that large uh, individual level data genetic cohorts from let's say the UK Biobank cannot that easily be just co-analyzed with the FinGen Biobank. There is a lot of consent forms and most of those biobanks just reject the combination and the co-analysis of individual level data uh, simply due to privacy concerns. 
This is also true when you try to do very large multi-ancestry analysis. Combining data coming from different ancestries is actually quite challenging, uh, not only from a technical point of view, but again from a privacy point of view. Uh, so finding ways to actually summarize the data in a useful way and combine only the summary level rather than individual level data uh, is um, already considered uh, as one approach to um, address this uh, problem. Another qu problem is data equity, or being able to learn, run a large-scale biobank GWAS on your laptop. I know that some very big pharma companies have a lot of money and they have hundreds of thousands of pounds in computational resources every year, so for them it doesn't matter if they run um, you know, a thousand trades for a couple of months' time on their machines. But if you're talking about equity and uh, uh, equality in research uh, in academia and the industry, there's a lot of developing countries where research teams and small biotech simply don't have those resources. So providing them with approaches and tools that can help them to run their analysis on a laptop and uh, achieve the same results is uh, also something that can drive uh, data equity forward. Going to <clears throat> computational efficiency and the computational challenges faced, right now the fastest approach in the market is considered to be Regini. Regini to run on the whole UK biobank, which is uh, around, let's say, 3,000 trades or some, yeah, uh, 2,400 trades, I believe. Uh, it takes around three or four months from what I have gathered. Um, and this is when you analyze 10 million SNPs in half a million people. Our future health is aiming to collect data from 5 million people, and they're aiming to do that at the whole genome sequencing level, which means that from 10 million SNPs, we're moving to 100 or 150 million points on the gene. How are we aiming to analyze this type of data and to do it in a way that we get results fast and um, access those results as quickly as possible so that we can generate hypotheses or validate hy our hypothesis. Not everyone can keep throwing more and more resources. Our computational resources are limited up to a point, and the more people you add to your analysis, the bigger bottleneck it is. Another big computational challenge is the GWAS replication. When you run one GWAS analysis in, let's say, 40,000 people, you aim to identify a similar data set of another, let's say, 20,000 people or 25,000 people, and you run your analysis in it uh, to replicate your findings. If you collect 5 million people from our future health, what data set are we going to use to replicate our findings? So it's, it, people are really considering now approaches to utilize some non-parametric techniques to actually run the replication on their studies and also evaluate the susceptibility uh, on your results of unknown population stratification because the current methods, they need to be provided with certain confounding factors such as age or sex. But this is not tr But um, what about if there is uh, other unknown population stratification factors that come with larger and larger cohorts? Um, polygenic risk scores suffer from the same issues. Uh, biobank design uh, planning for what, how you're going to collect your data, super important. So um, is your current design uh, appropriate of your biobank or do you need to change your design? You don't want to collect data from 100,000 people that is absolutely useless. It's just a waste of resource and time. Uh, health, equity, health equity is another challenge <clears throat> in biobank design. Essentially, um, the aim is to evaluate the impact of over or underrepresented population subtypes in a population and how they're going to affect the disease landscape so that you act, um, very effectively recruit the right people in it. Imagine the UK. In the UK, we have a lot of migration coming from the Commonwealth, coming from Europe. Um, these different uh, populations that are migrating uh, to the UK, they have different uh, genetic patterns. We need to account for how they're going to affect the mixture and, and um, our genetic background in, in the next decade so that we make sure that we collect our biobank data appropriately today so that one day when these people become diseased or they're susceptible to certain diseases, we can uh, predict that and treat them effectively. So <clears throat> going past uh, that, um, <clears throat> uh, in Optima uh, and BioAccelerate, we co-developed uh, an issue. It's a GWAS solution. 
Um, it's like a GWAS method, and we believe that it is a potential solution to some of these uh, um, challenges. I don't say this is the right tool, but I think it's a tool that is thinking in the right direction. And I'll, I'll tell you very quickly now why. So EGWAS was uh, developed in a collaboration with FinGen and some other commercial collaborators. And the main ask from FinGen was like, we have this data a cohort of 100,000 people uh, that we have enriched from an allelic and phenotypic point of view. Our reviewers are asking, was it done correctly or not? Because right now we want to pay to genotype another 200,000 people. So now is the time to know whether our enrichment was correct or not. So this is how actually BioAccelerate helped. We essentially supported <coughs> FinGen to evaluate and motivate their biobank design. Uh, this led to two publications uh, in Nature, uh, and this is actually how we came to develop this um, novel uh, GWAS method that turns out to be uh, almost 1,500 times faster than the fastest um, state-of-the-art methods. The partnership was mainly driven by Biogen uh, that guided the subject matter expertise, and they also set the key objectives of the study. And this is also the two different publications that led to it. The method was first used to identify novel genetic associations just from summary level statistics, which means there is no individual level data. There was only summary statistics from GWAS analysis. And also the same summary statistics were used to motivate the biobank design by FinGen. Um, very quickly, the methodology, um, highlights of the methodology, we, we compared EGWAS directly to Regini across different diseases with varying prevalence in the genetic arch architecture, and we showed very good concordance um, between the uh, p-values and the betas and the standard errors. We also did computational efficiency testing where we showed that we are at least 1,000 times faster than Regini. Actually, we intentionally run EGWAS on... Uh, I think it's almost 900 binary traits in the UK Biobank. With the whole QC steps and everything, we did that for less than 36 minutes. Uh, uh, thir less than 36 hours, sorry. And um, this is some examples that highlight uh, how easy, um, that um, even with a couple of CPUs, you can actually run a GWAS analysis fairly quickly. The GWAS tool, because it was designed to evaluate the Biobank design, also has forecasting capabilities that helped us to actually evaluate FinGen and what would happen if you had 300,000 people rather than 100,000 people with the current genetic background. This is the maths and the core mathematical innovation. For those of you that might be familiar with the newton raphson algorithm, the whole idea is that we essentially adapted it to work with summary level data, that is sufficient statistics, rather than with individual level data. And this for sufficient statistics, sufficient statistics is summaries of the data that are enough to run the same analysis and reach the same conclusion as you would with the full data. So these four summary statistics that we require to run a GWAS analysis are just the number of the controls in the cases and the minor low frequency within the controls and within the cases. And plugging those summary statistics in this adapted newton raphson algorithm in a regression framework, we reach the same conclusions. But we don't require individual level data. And just Comparing to status quo and conventional methods, we realized uh, quickly that, well, we have the computational efficiency. We also have the privacy preserving because right now we don't need individual level data. You can actually just give us the allele frequencies in your cases and controls from your different big biobank cohorts, and we can just co-analyze them because you're not breaching any uh, uh, privacy and consent uh, requirements in this way. And also, we have forecasting capabilities, so we can help with biobank design. And just to summarize, if any of you is interested in looking at the preprint that is, we're currently doing revisions on, <clears throat> um, you can go and check out all the examples. This is the examples that, uh, th this is essentially the challenges that we have managed to address with some of our uh, examples from the paper. Um, Obviously, running a massive meta-analysis, uh, we still haven't started working on it um, because it, it requires just, um, I guess there is also no interest from our clients, but also it's um, not of uh, priority for us right now. We have already started working on polygenic risk scores, though, and um, uh, we already have ideas of how to utilize uh, bootstrapping, let's say, uh, in order to extract more robust polygenic risk scores. So I hope that I gave you an overview of GWAS, how it's integrated in drug discovery, 
real life examples and also how a new way of thinking about methods, classical methods, can help us to address some of the challenges linked to GWAS. questions, and this is traditional, I'll lead off with one. Um, so, if this requires that you assign to each uh, allele or SNP whether it's going to act in a recessive dominant or additive fashion, how easy is that in practice? So, the, um, the method, and I had it actually here, but yeah, there is no, uh, no time. The method is actually very easily adapted to different uh, genetic models. So additive, dominant, uh, or recessive, uh, or at least we have adapted it for um, only the stream mo genetic models because I think these are the most popular ones. The, it's very easy because the only thing that needs to be done in this situation, it turns out, is to adapt your minor allele frequencies. So you need to change uh, your minor allele frequencies responding to the models. Okay. Uh, right. so, and you just so plug if those. You, if you plain don't know, which will happen in a lot of cases if you're doing de novo discovery, mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, right. okay. You can try the three in parallel uh, rather yeah. than stick to the additive, uh, which is usually the classical one. Okay, all right. So it, it's, it's a little bit of a fishing expedition, but probably one that's forgivable. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 essentially. No, no, you? Yeah. Uh, so, great, Frank, thank you, great talk. Uh, in terms of causality, there's two other methods that kind of come to mind. I just wanted, and they're mm -hmm. all very different, but I just wanted, just so I understand it better, to explain how this relates to them. So the first is, has this got any relationship to, for example, Shapley values and the Shapley value generation? It, it seems similar, am I wrong? Oh, okay, so you're trying us in machine learning now. Oh, I'm uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, no, 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 it's, it's okay. So uh, we have not done it. Uh, it's something that we have been discussing because Shapley values are used a lot for classification, making models more interpretable. And um, I think that, yeah, if, if you want, especially if you want to apply XGBoost, let's say, or decision trees for uh, classification, I would definitely say it can be done. We haven't tried it. It's something we have discussed, though, and I think that probably other... Yeah, yeah, yeah it's just there's that many hours a day. Okay. <laughs> I mean, the second question is going to have to say answer then, because I was, I was thinking about knowledge graphs and mm -hmm. people try and understand causality of knowledge graphs. And yeah. Is it something that you want to feed into knowledge graphs? So, yeah, yeah. So we already have um, looked into that uh, and we have done some work around it. Um, I don't have it as an example in my slides. Uh, it's a very good question, and actually we are building knowledge graphs, um, or causal networks if you want to call them, uh, through a combination of co-localization and Mendelian randomization. Because co-localization is fantastic for you trying to overlap hundreds or thousands of traits. So for example, you have, let's say, 200 autoimmune traits, and you want to test them in certain cell lines of interest for all the genes available, which means that you have four or five thousand, let's say, molecular traits for a region and 200 GWAS traits. You, when you run co-localization that, you can identify for which traits and cell lines and genes um, there is a genetic overlap. So that is one layer of your network. In parallel, you can run Mendelian randomization in both directions because Mendelian randomization can tell you what the direction of the effect is. So usually people in practice many times run analysis in both directions, trying to, to essentially say, yes, the impact of the genetic variance on being sick from Parkinson's disease goes via LARC2 expression, let's say. And I run the opposite analysis, testing that the Parkinson's disease did not cause the LARC2 expression. So essentially that guarantees them that they know that if there is a causality, they also know the directionality. That cannot be done with co-localization. But this adds the other layer of the co um, knowledge graph, which also have a, has a direction. Uh, so we have done it with IBD uh, as an example, actually, uh, in the past. So it's very interesting, yeah. Coming edge. Analysis. How long do you think it's now going to take you 
to analyze this whole new release of today's biobound for genomes? <clears throat> so um, the, the example that I mentioned for the 900 binary traits, that was done on UK Biobank. And it was done in 330,000 people with the whole QC and the extraction of the minor low frequencies, because uh, we have a fantastic engineering team that's very good at optimization as well. Um, for the 900 traits, traits, it took less than 36 hours, and there are still parts of the code we know that we can optimize. It's just that Biogen, which is our client on that, they were not really interested in speeding it up further. Uh, and spending more, more time on it, they, they are interested in other applications, so um, we, we just haven't pushed it further. Our assumption is um, that if we run it for the whole genome sequencing data, for the 330, because the method still has some limitations, we don't account for, for covariates, so it means we have to analyze a homogeneous cohort. Um, so we have, uh, for such large cohorts, we don't have to be as stringent but we still have to make sure that um, the ethnicity is the same and we still need to be very careful with the relatedness that we add to it. This is why we didn't analyze 500,000 people but only 330,000 people. But I believe that if we extend it to the 100 million, it's not going to be 36 uh, hours, it's just going to be by 10, so 360 hours. Um, so I don't know how many days that is. Mm. 15 days, so two weeks. Next question. That's in the interim. I'm ask, okay, so if you're going to go with is GWAS, run traditional GWAS, Regenia, or whatever, mm -hmm. what are you losing or potentially missing? If I was a researcher, what exactly. I would do <laughs> is I would, uh, in the in the interest of time, I'd first take whole genome sequencing clearly because I think we have extracted as much as we can from UK Biobank, unless you want to combine traits and phenotypes mm -hmm. and come up with your own definitions of phenotypes or diseases. Um, I would run EGUAS as a variable selection method. So if I have 150 million SNPs across from whole genome sequencing data, I'd use EGUAS to um, decrease that number to 10 million SNPs or 5 million SNPs. And then I would run Regini or FASGWA, where I can also account for relatedness or for ethnicity. And the commensurate decrease in the number of patients you're going to have to run it upon as well? Um, well, I, if, if I do it only for variable selection purposes, yeah. I, um, I'd probably not care that much if my population is that ho homogeneous. Yeah, I'd rely on... More in the G, GWAS step, the subsequent mm -hmm. step. Uh, afterwards. Might, yes, yes, yeah, abs absolutely. Where if you've managed to reduce the number of variables, therefore, well, actually, therefore, you could probably run it on more patients in a computational mm -hmm. sense. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because we are um, essentially we are uh, because we take the summary statistics mm -hmm. rather than the actual individual level data. We don't have every additional um, subject in a normal regression analysis increases the complexity by another square. Uh, yeah, yeah. Depends on the method, but r roughly. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't care about how many people, how many people your summary statistics come from, because the only thing we use is the number of case and controls in your data set. And this is specific for binary GWAS. Quantitative GWAS, um, which is linear regressions, they don't suffer from the same curse because um, um, <clears throat> because of the way that linear regression works. Logistic regression is, uh, because of the log odds ratios, yeah. uh, the way you have to do the newton raphson algorithm is a bit more challenging. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is what takes a long time, actually converting between a linear and logistic regression model to obtain your parameters. Okay, okay. Uh, what, what brought that to mind was that quite some years ago now, it said that for some of the more complex psychiatric disease, they're probably going to have to run cohorts of like a million, ten million patients in order to one tangle because of the complexity of interactions. Mm -hmm. Not a lot. So, so that's intriguing. Just one question. So on one side you said it took 36 hours to do some calculation. Was it the human time or machine time? <laughs> that's a very good question. Uh, if I... 
think about it correctly, I think it was machine time because uh, we were running, so every trade we were using 30 CPU cores to run and on our computational resources we are allowed to run 180 CPUs at a time. So we were running six trades at a time on 30 CPUs each. Sorry? No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I mean, if you want to run 900 trades on your laptop, you also have to think, uh, think about it. Uh, what machine you buy? Uh, I mean, it's a lot of RAM. Yeah. Yeah. And then give me the name of your supply. Hi there. How are you doing? I just had a question about ethnicity becoming a challenge and ethnicity as a politically defined construct. Do you use um, reported ethnicity to segregate populations or do you...? Uh, we use genetic ethnicity. OG Wasis use <clears throat> genetic ethnicity. Uh, this is why... Um, I think that right now, if you want to publish in some of the big journals, you actually have to define and say that you use ethnicity only in like um, a genetic context, and you have to only use sex. You cannot use gender as a word. Uh, they've really changed everything around it. But um, y usually the practice in GWAS is that you take your cohort and let's say common minor, uh, common alleles, uh, sorry, uh, SNPs uh, with uh, common a Leo, I don't know, made uh, common, oh, no. yeah, yeah, uh, sniffs with common frequencies, um, yeah, common alleles, and uh, you, you run a co-analysis on those with well-defined uh, genetic cohorts, such as the Thousand Genome Project, where you have well-defined Italian Central Europeans from different parts of Africa, different parts of Asia, and you run this co uh, PCA analysis essentially. Uh, where you see, uh, where it's very easy to see uh, whether you have some genetic outliers in your data set. And depending on what uh, the genetic background of your population is, m most of the time people select a cluster around, um, let's say, the uh, Caucasian ethnicity or the Japanese ethnicity, let's say, to select those patients. Uh, and they analyze only those patients or they might be a little bit more inclusive, but they actually add, uh, add the first 10 or 20 principal components as covariates in their linear or logistic regression model so that they can account for within population stratification. Because even within uh, an ethnicity, you might have a huge difference between North and South British people, even, even, even if they are labeled as white British. There, there might still be uh, a lot of population stratification. So you want to account for that when you run your genetic analysis. So essentially it's a proxy for variation? Yes. Yeah. So you just want to find more homogenous genomes? Well, no. The challenge now is how to add more ancestries to your analysis. And now there is more tools coming up that are um, multi-ancestry meta-analysis for multiple traits where there are people, because some traits, especially when they're very rare, you don't have enough power. And especially if they're from an underrepresented population, let's say somewhere from Africa or from uh, the Middle East, let's say, uh, it's very challenging for you to do a GWAS analysis. You don't have enough power. So what people is, you do is they try, uh, the new methods at least, are trying to use similarity to common traits and kind of run a meta-analysis where they're taking advantage of the power for rheumatoid arthritis, let's say, to increase the power of um, lupus. Because they're very similar traits, lupus, let's say, is a rare disorder. I might be lying here, sorry. Uh, but they're trying to increase the power through uh, <coughs> common traits, through this sort of meta-multi-trait, multi-ancestry analysis. Mm -hmm. So this is a big challenge now. Um, no, no, we cannot do that with IGWAS. Uh, what we can do, uh, and what we have done, is actually run IGWAS on the same um, SNPs, but in different cohorts, and then we can evaluate how much uh, uh, every cohort, every ethnicity is contributing to the enrichment of that SNP, and it's important to a certain disease. 
uh, so that we, for example, can advise on, well, we think that from that ethnicity, you actually need to enrich more because uh, it looks like uh, it might be giving you more signals and more power to your studies or vice versa. You don't, you don't get enough power from these ethnicities, uh, enrich your design from them. We, obviously, we can just take everything and calculate the allele frequencies from the entire planet population. Uh, the problem is that then you're going to get such a mash that it will be very difficult for you to interpret what you're getting and whether, I mean, you can do it, but it's not going to be an interpretable result. I think that some of the smallest GWASs in general is around 2,000 people, 1,000 disease, 1,000 controls. Um, I mean, people do run it with lower numbers, but then you don't have enough power. Um, for each GWAS, I'd say that it's definitely designed for larger studies. Um, we have tested it in smaller studies, and it still performs well, but I mean, I think that for a smaller study, Regine is probably going to give you very good results for not that long time. Let's say 4,000, 5,000 people. Ijiwas adds a benefit when you have 100,000 people, 200,000 people, and uh, this is when uh, current approaches just become slower by adding more people. In some instances, I think yes, because wh one thing that we did was to actually run <coughs> run uh, each GWAS on uh, uh, by adding uh, different degrees of relatedness patients. So we had uh, maximum unrelated patients that were first analyzed, and then we added the third degree relatedness people, second, and everyone. Mm -hmm. And actually, there was very small effect of the relatedness on our results. We also compared them to Regini when Regini had accounted for covariates and it hadn't accounted for covariates. And to be honest, even Regini doesn't benefit too much from adding covariates for such large cohorts. Um, the only uh, thing that um, essentially, if you want to call it, breaks us, uh, or essentially is a challenge, is when you start adding multiple ancestries. Because allele frequencies really vary from one ethnicity to another one. But I don't th think that even Regini can properly, or any of the existing models can properly account for, rela uh, for such drastic um, ancestries through PC uh, components. In my opinion, you need to put a categorical variable to have a stronger effect on it uh, to account for it. Yeah, the method is super easy to be extended for interactions. It's, uh, we just have other priorities, but um, a combination of interaction is, uh, so the way the method works from a mathematical point of view is that um, it takes the genotype, which is AA8 or TT, and it assumes um, multinomial distribution. If you have an interaction, you have, um, and a, a genotype has, um, three options, or is of size two. Uh, if you add an interaction, you become of size three. But uh, the same conclusions, the same math applies for it. I mean, probably we just need to revisit the summary statistics again to How make sure. How many degrees of interaction can you do? To be honest, <laughs> I guess that up to, I guess that up to a multinomial of size six or seven, we can easily go, which would mean an interaction of three or four, maybe four ways pushing it already. But how interpret that after for drug development? I leave that to you. Omnigenic model. Omnigenic model, yeah. Which was just, you know, the paper yeah. of desperation. 
<laughs> okay. I think I think we really actually liked it at the time that it came out, uh, but it, 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 it makes sense. It was kind of here yeah, this nice metaphor for what you said. How well do you sleep at night? Well, it probably depends upon the people in your household, and uh, you know, to a lesser extent, your neighbours, and to a lesser extent, your know, neighbours' neighbours, and you know, and also where they go to work and so forth like that. So just to diminishing small degrees, you're basically you're affected by everyone. So yeah, it was intriguing. Okay, thank you, Zan. Right, so uh, we traditionally go to the pub to complain about our jobs afterwards. <laughs> and uh, Manny will leave us there. I think I've posted the pub location in the comments there. Uh, we will probably have a social meetup.